Welcome to the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. I'm down here in deepest Dorset. I'm on Chesil Beach. I'm in my little tent thing that I've rigged up here. I think they call them beach buddies. And Chesil Beach, I don't think I fished more than once as a kid years ago. I couldn't even tell you where it was. So it's all new to me. A steep storm beach of absolutely immense proportions. But I've come down here because I've heard on the grapevine there's some good fishing, which it always does throw up. Very temperamental, it can be you know really good on fishing or really good off fishing. I'm gonna give you a few tips on steep beach fishing here. It's all shingle, it's all ground up shingle, deep water, and it's so nice to see really clear water here. It's really such a pleasure. I've been fishing the Bristol Channel where they've got fantastic shore fishing, but it's you know really brown muddy water. Obviously it comes down the estuary, comes down from the River Severn. But here, I mean there's guys up and down here, they tell me they can get 40 to 50 anglers on here sometimes. But there's guys up and down here now, and most of them I think are heaving feathers out for mackerel because it's sort of late autumn. So I'm not interested in the mackerel, I'm interested in anything I can catch whatsoever, possibly codling, and I've got some small hooks. I've got a real array of rods going out there. I read up on the internet, it says don't cast too far, it's not great casting a long way because it's so deep close to shore here. You can see by the angle of the beaches, millions, millions of tons of shingle here. Obviously from last winter, 2014 storms, it's been moved around from what I've been told. Who knows what's out in front of me. I'm fishing down by somewhere they call the Dragon's Teeth. I see no dragons, I see a load of concrete blocks. But this is the general area that they tell me is pretty good. So hey ho, we're going to give it a go anyway. It's windy, but one thing is for sure, it's blowing offshore. And the sun's out, whoopee! find with a steep beach like this when there's no apparent features there that you're you've got to get in your mind other than the tide coming in and out which it obviously does low tide at the moment I'm fishing the flood tide all the way up into darkness hopefully you've got to think of lateral tide and that's the tide going sideways hitting this beach and either flooding up towards the east ebbing back down towards the west now I don't do a lot of fishing I do a lot of beach fishing ah, not a great deal really because I catch so many other fish as well but I do enjoy my beach fishing. It's all part of the wild blue yonder and excitement stuff out in the open air. I do try and think about it. I just want to throw it out there. Now, if the fish are going up and down in a particular zone there looking for food, that food's going to be tumbled all the way along a certain, a certain channel, if you like. It could be 10 yards out, 20 yards out, 30 yards out. It might even be 80 or 90 yards out. It all depends on the day, what the weather's, what the wind's doing. Is it churned up? Is it big tides, small tides? So you want to try and get in your mind, if you're fishing a couple of three rods, whatever you want to do, is to space them. One long, one medium, one short. If you've only got the two rods, one about three quarter distance, let's say 80 yards. Do not neglect putting one in very, very close when you're fishing steep two beaches. Because years ago, I used to fish Cape Hatteras, what we used to call the point. I think there's more anglers there than there is here now. And it used to be not casting all the way. You'd have to watch what they, but well, they used to call them sloughs, which was a gap in the reef, in the surf break of the beach, and that's where the big fish used to come through. Big red drum, striped bass, blue fish, that's the sort of stuff I used to go for over there. It used to come through these channels. Now, if you could find those channels, the same thing as where the food's coming through, so the fish are going to come through as well, you're in with a real good chance. So on a steep beach like this, you really want to start thinking of your exact distance. It's not all about long casting when you've got deep water right in front of you. Fish like bass, codling, they're going to come in when they find the zone the small fish are moving up and down in, that's where they're going to be feeding, they're going to stay in that area. So just keep moving about and give it say 20-30 minutes each area. You can even fish with a plane bomb if there's not a big tide and just wind in every now and then and bump it so you're covering that lateral tide area. When it gets in very close to where the waves turn over, you get what's called a littoral zone and that's where it churns the food over and sucks it back down just on the edge where it flattens out like this. If you imagine the beach comes down like this, I'm up here casting out, as it comes down like this, that's the littoral zone right at the base where the food mostly stays. Good little tip for you, but I've got some totally awesome more guys. This whole area is known as the Jurassic Coastline 
and that's mainly due to the huge number of fossils that are found, mainly over in those cliffs in the background. So it's a historically significant area and you have to ask yourself, is this the reason there are so many fish down there? Is this the reason the anglers go there because they're sort of drawn to it? Maybe they were all cavemen years ago and this always was a good area to get some fish. Of course, they never had tackle. Right, waiting for bites, guys. Little tips if you're beginners. Obviously, the experienced guys just move along. You obviously know all the little tips and stuff. Get yourself, if you're a beginner, a little piece of wood like this. What is it, half an inch? It's just, it's just a piece of two by half like that, as you can see. And I've cut it very, very small. In fact, possibly about the same size as a squid. That, my friends, is a little cutting board. And together with my pen knife, because I forgot my filleting knife, nor do I need it when I'm just beach fishing like this, I can put on there squid, anything I want, mackerel, slice it up. I don't have it in the stones because when you try and cut fish or bait of any description with stones up and down, it always tears the meat. You do not get a neat presentation. So that's what you want to do. Get yourself a tiny little piece of wood, keep it in your bag with you. You can throw it away when you finish with it, you know, at home or in a rubbish bin, and cut yourself a fresh one when you go fishing. So easy. A totally awesome tip makes life oh so simple. Nothing could be easier than that, could it? But hang on, yes, you're all yucky. Go into a charity shop, ask them for their rags bin, and give them whatever you want, a donation, 20p, something like that, and then generally give you some towels, 50p, whatever you want. Okay, lash out, give them a pound, give them a pound. They'll give you some towels, which generally go into the rags bin for recycling, and you can cut these rag towels up into hand-sized rags, and you can use a fresh hand towel each time and if you don't want to use it, you can either wash it when you get back, or you can dump it in a bin. You know, I recycle mine, wash them all. And I tell you what I do, wash them in water, fresh water, mind you, it gets the salt out, and then a little light breach, squeeze it out and just leave them, and they'll be as good as gold. Tiny tip, but so nice to get hold of that fishing rod, and you don't cake it in slimy squid or mackerel. Now you can use fixed ball reels, you can use multipliers. I used to use multipliers a lot, all the time, multiplying reels, but because I'm on such a, a time schedule with the fishing and the filming, it's, you know, it's much easier just to get a fixed ball, one of the big fixed ball reels, load it up with line, easy to cast, they're easy to operate, and yes, they catch fish. Maybe they don't cast as far as the multiplier, but they cast far enough to catch fish, and let's face it, that's all that matters. Okay, another totally awesome tip. Keep with you the very, very basics. Now, just for tying off, when you tie off knots, it's always a tag end, and up to about 20 pound line, my canines can go through it. They get to about 50, it takes me about five minutes to chew through it. You can either use a knife and end up trying to cut your thumb, or you, if you haven't got a pair of scissors, why not try and get some of these little slide out ones, like that, and they just work by squeezing them together like that. Just very, very, very sharp. So they're only for knots, but they are so, so easy and quick to use. You can pop them in your pocket, and of course, they are safety sheath. They're in like that. Let's just press the button, and they slide back down, pop them in your pocket. Another thing you want to keep close by, elasticated thread, because if you do want to cast a little bit farther, farther with a bigger bait, wind some elasticated thread around the bait. It ties it up, it compacts it, keeps it neat and tidy. Keep that very close to where you're fishing as well. But to be honest, just keep it almost where everything is in one spot on a beach. Everybody's done it, I guess. They've tipped a box of swivels over the stones. My God, you'll never find them, never. So, what I do, sounds really basic, if you don't wanna, if you want easy access, I've got my box of swivels, but I've also got an elastic band around it like that. And what I can do is I can pop the absolute basic items I need all the time for tackling up in that rubber band like this. I just tuck them under there, and then I know where I've got them immediately, and if the fish are biting, I can really turn around fast. 
But my other bonus is this. It's a little flat sharpening stone because if, like me, you don't get to go three or four times a week, I just go once a month, maybe something like that, maybe twice a month ashore fishing, some of those small hooks might just want to touch up with a stone. And what you do is always work it so that you're going from the, away from the point, not into the point, and just rub it backwards and forwards, sharpen it up because a sharp hook catches those finicky little fish, you know, when they're not biting properly, they're a bit finicky. Just having a little sharpening stone like this might just pay dividends in the long run. Of course it goes in that elastic band as well, and I've got it all there, like that. Okay, for my uh, one of my outside distant baits, I'm just fishing a plain bomb, just there, with a long tail wire, which with an offshore wind is going to give me a little bit extra distance there, just to put one out. Got to always try one a little bit further out, and that gives stability to the lead. It stops the lead wobbling in the air. Okay, so straight pulley rig. That's a normal old, good old trusty pulley rig there. And for bait, I'm going to be using a nice ragworm. Now when the hook's dry, just wet it and you'll find that the ragworm's body will go over a little bit better. And then another little tip I do, when I'm going for long distance, I do on the bait, you go right through the mouth of the ragworm. All right, and roll his body all the way up there, pop it over the eye, don't worry about juices coming out because that's what you want is those juices. And obviously it gets thinner towards the tail end. And then what I do, I've used my little bait board there just to cut up some strips of squid because if the crabs chew this off and they already have on my first cast they don't chew the squid off quite so easily and I might still have an outside chance of getting a fish so I'm just using a whole ragworm but with a tag end of squid there and I'm going to fire it out I guess anywhere between probably make 110 120 I suppose but I'm bulk of my baits are going to be fish close in but I am going to send one out reasonable distance just in case Okay, for the inside rig, I've just got like a triple clip, it's got those cascade links to drop off, but I'm only going to lob it about 30, 40 yards, so I'm not even going to bother to clip that one down. So that's three baits there, on those small I think they're about a 2-0 hook, a little tag of squid on there as well, you can see a little tag of squid, very very small sliver of squid. These can all rotate around there without tangling as you can see. So remember. A lot of those fish just come from a simple 20 to 40 yard throw out. You don't need to power it out, just lob it out there under calm conditions and you're in with a shout. Okay, final rig, a straight running ledger with a long tail, homemade long tail bomb there, straight running ledger. I'm just going to lob this one just behind the wave line, maybe 20 yards, 20 yards. I've got 20 pound mono there, I've got a whole squid on a two hook panel rig there. I've got a nice pink bead at this end, but I'm going to just whip this end of this squid together just so it's bound around that top hook. I'm using elasticated thread just to hold it nice and straight because if there is a big bass, and I have never caught a big bass ever, ever really, really close to shore. So something new for me, but you know people do, they always catch big bass close to the shore, very rarely to the distance casters actually come in with the big bass, they call catch bass but so they don't get the big ones. The big ones are hunting in what I call that little zone that I told you about earlier, where all the food's turned over and tumbled over in the wave line, even though there's no, no wave line there now as such, that's still a feeding zone very, very close. And if there was a fish, I can't imagine a small fish, a pouting, a whiting, not so much a mackerel, anything, a wheat crab, it's been smashed to pieces and tumbled around in the heavy surf, He's going to roll down, he's going to wash backwards and forwards in this literal zone, just, well, I'm looking at it now, 20 yards out. And that's what I envisage just to be a dead squid that's been damaged by some storm or other method. And it's been damaged by me now, I've got two hooks going through it. There we go, on right through the eyes, and that's ready just to lob out there. 
This is just a banker, which you never know. People will not laugh when I walk up the beach with a six pound bass. I know I probably won't, but I'm just telling you, enough people do this, get a bonus rod, just throw it close in, someone's gonna come in with a real lunker. Anywhere between about 20 to 40 yards out. Cost nothing, bit of effort. Now another thing, if you're going to be investing in some good tackle and some, some time and effort doing more beach fishing, you enjoy it, you want to get yourself one of these, whatever they call them, beach buddies, beach shelters really. This one looks like it's called IMAX or something, I'll show it to you in a second. They're really good, one person can carry them, they're not an umbrella, I used to use an umbrella or a big jacket, because we were tough in those days. But do you know what, since I've used this thing, it's heaven, I'll show you around the inside. Look. Gives you loads of space, it's a nice tough material here, nice tough material. I've got everything I need in here. Look, I've got my little bait board there, got my knife, got my rags, got my cameras. Cameras all rigged up, tripods, food over in this corner. And I've got my tackle down here, and there is thread, snippers, hooks to over sharpening. And the benefit of this is, this flap at the bottom here, you can cover over with stones from the outside and the inside, and anchor it all down. It also comes with a hood at the top, so this can slide right out, and actually you can put a chair in there and sit in there if you want. I mean, I've just got it really to keep the cameras, I want to keep the cameras dry to be honest, that's what I've got it for. But it really is a handy piece of kit. No, no, I'm not selling them. I'm just telling you, I'm quite impressed with this. It's a handy piece of kit. We did actually get it for the cameras, but I can see I'm out of the wind, I'm comfortable, I'm not cold, and if it rains, sweet. Check them out. Now in the frame that's coming up out of this one, you'll see I was trying to get all arty with the camera and use my Polaroids to actually get a nice angle picture. But just watch between the nose piece of, the, of those glasses, watch for the bite, here it comes, here it comes, watch, watch, there. Wham, the rod's going over and there's total panic. The camera gets dropped, the glasses gets dropped. There's the usual just manic, well, mayhem basically, where you're trying to keep tight to a fish that you know is a good fish certainly wasn't a little flounder or a little whiting this one and I've actually walked back up the beach because I didn't even have time to turn the handle on the reel I've tried to sort the camera out I think I've actually got the camera sideways in my mouth as we speak like this trying to get you some footage there of what's going to turn out to be a pretty decent fish eventually I get the camera turned up the right way and I can actually then begin to wind down, but not before I wind myself into my other fishing lines, as you can see, over and under the other lines. Now this is the most dangerous time of losing any decent fish, is in that wave line, because the backwash, the undertow, can actually put an extra lot of pressure on you and pull that hook out. And of course, you've got to use the wave, the next wave coming is going to be the one that I've got to try and ease the fish up on the beach but with the limited brain cells that I have I didn't allow for the fact that I was standing where the wave's going to come and here comes a wave over a lovely pair of leather shoes right up to the shins but do I care will the wife shoot me yes she will I don't care I've got a fish on the beach a really big mullet delighted with that one and of course, the next thing I have to do is get you guys some more pictures of it, even though the shoes are wet, so I carry it back to my little prehistoric man cave up there, and then we can take a proper look at it. Well, there you go, people. <laughs> what a result, the rod really came out the rest. 
a jumbo mullet. I don't know what type it is. Just nicked in that bottom jaw. Is that a golden grey? I don't know. Would you guys know out there? Thin lipped, thick lipped. Look at that mullet. What a result. The rub was just nearly out the rest. I couldn't believe it. Totally awesome. Beautiful mullet. It's got these little gold dots along the side of it. You can see that. Crackerjack fish. Go out the road up here at about a pound and a half scaldy bass. But this fish is a really, really nice fish here. Pleased with that one. Do you know what? I think that's the first mullet I've ever caught off a beach on beach rod. I never knew they fought so hard on beach rod. I've caught them on light tackle before in shallow water. But that is something else. I was, really, I was really pleased to get that huge mullet, but I've got a double booty, so here are the shoes. They're drying out now. And here's what remains of the socks. Ow, I hate walking with bare feet. Ah! Hard stones and soft white feet. They've never seen the light of day for 42 years. Ah! Well, since seeing that guy uh, get that small scrawly bass on the feathers close in, I've had definitely a bass swirl at a piece of squid in the water as I've been winding it just out of the wave exactly where I had the mullet where I told you right at the last minute. And I just thought then, I thought, you know what, that's a school bass that's come in there about a couple of pounds. So what I've done, I've got no feathers with me. I've got some silver paper that the wife's wrapped up my sandwiches in and some old fruit pie packets, silver. I've cut those up. I've made myself a set of artificial feathers here for small hooks or only Aberdeen hooks very small I don't think you can see them there right, let's get hold of that a little bit more because these are almost almost a work of art there you go folks what do you think of that yeah shocking isn't it really but it's gonna have to do it is a pie wrapper fruit pie wrapper and I've got four of those a clip at the bottom I've got a set of four feathers made up we even got little fish tails cut in the bottom of them I expect they would last about four casts but you never know it's evening High tide is coming on, the light is lowering in the sky. It's looking very good with this clean water for something grabbing hold of these at the last minute. So while I've got my baits out there, I'm just gonna have a few casts with this. Just see if I can push my luck that totally awesome bit further. Now as this one is pretty much just a tips fishing one, just got lucky with their mullet. I thought I'll give you an old school tip here. And do you know what it is with bait? If you think I haven't got all the bait, one of the best flatfish baits you can get, if I can get myself untangled here, is, wait for this. That's very green for beach fishing, isn't it? But underneath that little bit of green and moss in there, there's some earthworms. Ordinary lobworms, ordinary earthworms are pretty good. They used to be excellent for flounder fishing. Not there's a lot of flounders around the south coast of the UK anymore, but these were very, very good for flounders and for place and general shore fishing. Now, I'm going to put some on here. I've only got very, very small hooks. The sun's going down now and I'm just going to thread them up. Look, see, look, a lovely big worm. Exactly the same as a small ragworm. But what I'm going to do is put the hook in, leaving a bit of head or tail showing. So it's got plenty to wiggle with there. So I come in just behind the head or the tail. And as you can see, if I leave that just like that, that's got plenty to wiggle. I've got very small hooks here, and that's what I'm going to use. So there you are. There's another for you. Another exclusive. Do not tell anybody on YouTube. Good for flatfish, especially flounders and dabs. Just plain, common earthworms. Is this not, this setting, honestly, the reason we all go fishing? Just look at it, absolutely superb. Flat calm sea, very rare to see, even off the British coastline. The sun setting down there, a fisherman casting out a set of mackerel feathers. Oh no, no, sorry. A fisherman casting out a set of mackerel feathers that are made from bits of cake wrapper. I mean, that's sad, isn't it? But seriously, this is what makes me go sea fishing. You've got that freedom of the open sea, the air, the fresh air, and it's not just me, there's a lot of young anglers down there, look, and older guys are like, 
all casting out there for mackerel or small bass. Now that's got to be better than sitting at home, surely. And here's a zoomed in shot of the sun setting looking like Saturn with the rings. Absolutely idyllic. It's the reason I love going beach fishing, shore fishing, out in my boat. That freedom of the sea is superb. Well, there we go, people. I think, I think all the little nibbles I've been getting are these gigantic fish, which you all know and love, called the pouty. And I think it's telling me to pack up. It's a nighttime species. I'm amazed we haven't had whiting here. Everybody else has packed up. It appears I have the whole of Chesil Beach to myself. But there it is. That's the culprit that's been stripping my bait. I'm gonna put him back, little pouting. And no wonder I'm getting my bait stripped. If these guys are out there, there's not going to be much scope for anything else except codling, which eat these. But I've got a two hour drive home, so I hope you've got a few tips there. Fishing down steep shingle beaches. I'm pleased with that mullet, that's for sure. You guys have got a few tips. Let's face it, it's been a nice day anyway. That's what it's all about. Don't forget to watch the totally awesome fishing show for more tips. <laughs>